Well, good morning. Give everybody a chance to log in. It's April the 19th. Hopefully we are approaching the end of the quarantine time period for Michigan. We'll see what happens. There's been a lot of pressure, a lot of people saying a lot of things to our government, to our governor, to the president. We'll see what happens. Waiting for people to log in. We found some music to play. It's a little weird because we're used to we're used to singing. We are people who sing during worship, and uh, I haven't done that mostly because you don't want to hear me singing. But we're to sing to one another, and this is an extremely limited uh, one way conversation for the most part, from me to you. So we haven't had music, we haven't had singing for that reason. Uh, however, there are various places you can go to find music. I like to find mine on Spotify, but uh, searchtv.org. They have a whole library of congregational singing that you're welcome to listen to at any time. And that's what we're listening to right now. And uh, it's good to see everybody this morning. I look forward to the time when... It's not through the computer like this, but we were, we'd be together. You're fine. All right. I've lost my love one another sign. I didn't make a new one yet. So here, don't panic, right? I don't know about you, but this uh, coronavirus thing, this quarantine's kind of wearing. It's getting, it's not burdensome. It's not hard. It's just becoming a drudge almost, isn't it? It's just, oh, it's another, it's another, it's another day. So I personally, I find that, uh, I'm an introvert. I like being home, I like not interacting with people. And uh, so this this is right up my alley. However, I must say, I'm finding that the longer I'm home and by myself, the more I like it. <laughs> so uh, it, I'm sure it does not help my wife at all one bit. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, church. Good morning, saints. I'm Scott Busich. I preach for the Escoda Church of Christ. This is my phone number, 989-305-2721. You can uh, call me or send me a text message, or uh, if you're watching live on Facebook, you can send me a message there. Uh, obviously, I'm conducting a worship service, so I won't get to you till later, but I'll respond to you as soon as I can. Um, we in the church, we love one another, we care for one another, we're concerned for one another. Uh, so... Um, if you are struggling, again, here's my phone number, 989-305-2721. You're welcome to call me, chat with me. I'm not a licensed counselor. There are places you can call that do have licensed counselors. Disaster Distress Helpline, 1-800-985-5990. That's a federal, uh, federal agency. You can call them. We want to make sure that people stay safe, not just from the virus, but stay safe emotionally, stay safe uh, uh, in their minds. So there's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. And then lastly, uh, for our veterans, and we've got numerous men and women who've served our country and we're grateful. Uh, there's a White House uh, VA hotline, 855-948-2311. You're welcome to call those as well. Good morning, saints. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you've given to us. We thank you for the, the, the this day, the beautiful weather. We thank you for the sunshine, Father. We look forward to warmer days. 
it's beautiful to see spring returning to to see the the grasses and the flowers growing and the trees preparing to bud their leaves father truly it's a good day we pray for those that are ill with the viruses the covid virus the flu whatever diseases that they're struggling with father give them strength we'd ask that you'd watch over them and heal them be with the doctors and nurses keep them safe and well and any other emergency medical personnel that may be out there father are there people in this country that are serving and serving well right now and, and we ask that you would bless them for their sacrifice and their willingness to put their lives on the line to be willing to expose themselves so that others may be treated may become well that they may be served uh, father our, our hearts go out to uh, joyce harrison's family and the loss of her cousin we pray that you'd watch over them as they mourn her passing father we thank you so much for your son jesus thank you for the blessings that we have through him we thank you for eternal life we look forward to the day when not only can we see each other face to face we look forward to the day when we can see you face to face in that glorious day. Until then, Father, we pray that this worship is acceptable in your sight. The things we do and say bring honor and glory to your name. And through your son's name we pray to you. Amen. All right, so Joyce uh, gave me a notification that uh, her cousin passed away. Um, she wanted me to give you uh, her name, just in case you know her, or, or knew her, uh, Doris Henderson Mahimdu Rich. She was a member of the Grand Bank uh, Church of Christ, and she did pass away because of this virus. Um, this vi uh, Oscoda, Iosco County, the count I checked this morning with the Michigan website, had 11 uh, ill, and we're still staying at one dead. So our medical personnel, they're doing a fine job keeping everyone alive. But we're up to 11 so the virus is here it's amongst the people that we interact with uh, keep yourself safe uh, you know practice hand washing wearing the mask social social isolation and distancing all of that stuff we want to get rid of this as soon as possible we want to get back to what is normal <laughs> we want to what we do want to do is get back to a situation where we don't have to be concerned or worried about who is sick and who is not so Take care of one another, saints. That's very important. This morning, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to look at, because we're so isolated. I wanted to look at various feasts that Jesus had gone to in his ministry, and and uh, there's so many. I don't have time for all of them. So we're going to look at just a couple. And in actuality, I want to start with not a feast itself. I want to start with a parable because. The parable that I want to start with uh, leads us to a parable of the wedding feast, which is very important concerning our relationship with God. And so for our per first passage this morning, what I want to start with is uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 33. If you turn to Matthew 21 verse 33, you can read with me. Hear another parable, and this is, uh, of course, Jesus speaking. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Well, they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? Uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, 
the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Now, we as Christians, hindsight 2020, man, we read this parable, the parable of the tenants, and it's so easy for us to understand what Jesus is saying. Even the Pharisees understood kind of what he was saying. It, 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 it just boggles the mind because Jesus gives us his parable and he says, here's the vineyard. The, the master makes up this vineyard. He, he, he sets everything up. It's perfect. It's beautiful. And he, and he rents it out. Now, the chief priests and the Pharisees in verse 45, they know that this is about them. Who do they think they are in this parable? Do they think that they're the owner of the vineyard? And the answer, of course, is no. Do they think that they're the servants of the master in the vineyard? The answer again is no, because they sat at Jesus. How dare he say such things against them? Well, what, what position do they occupy? They are the renters. They have leased property. Not, not physical property like literal dirt, because we're talking about the master, and we're talking about his servants, and we're talking about the son. And so who is that? And the answer, of course, is God. We're talking about the religious leaders of their day. They think that they have it all right. They got it all figured out. They got it all worked together, and they know what they're doing. And how dare God collect rent from them? I mean, just this thing, it, it, it's so it's so challenging because they are the ones who say we know god we know the scriptures we, we we are we are the heralders of the truth we know the proper way to worship we know the proper way to do everything and god sends servants and those servants are not literally identified but we would recognize those servants to be the prophets the ones that they speak for god they're there to collect for god who would those be the prophets and and the people of israel including the pharisees they they rejected them turned their backs on them they rejected john the baptist last prophet before jesus and and the parable jesus tells them the son well who's the son now again the Pharisees are mad. They don't think they're the son. They don't sit back and say, oh yeah, we are the son. They don't say that. They're mad at Jesus because he is making them look bad. So who are they? They are the renters. And who is the son? They are the ones who decide. They want to arrest him, verse 46. And later on, they're going to plot to kill him. So who's the son? And the answer, of course, we know the answer is Jesus. The, the whole point of this parable is, is so obvious. We know it. The Pharisees know it. And what's amazing is this. The Pharisees, even though they know the whole point of this parable, they still do the very thing that Jesus tells them they're going to do. Just think about that. Because... It, Okay, it, it's easy to look at them. Now, let's look at ourselves, look at myself. And and do I do the very thing I know is not right? I know it's the wrong thing to do. Do I do the thing that God has told me not to do? Jesus wants not just the Pharisees' attention. This is for us. Because the Pharisees, they didn't change. They aren't going to change the lessons for you and I, we, are we going to put ourselves in the position of being those Pharisees? We can look at them, we can say, ha, those guys, they're so foolish. Do, do we think that we're smarter than they are, wiser than they are? These guys knew it was about them and they still did the very thing that Jesus said they would do even as they are angered and frustrated. 
Now, as, as Jesus finishes, he gives them the, the point of that parable in verse 42 and following that, that the stone, and that's Jesus, of course, and we've got many scriptures that back that up, the stone that the builders, and that's the Pharisees, they reject, he becomes the cornerstone, the capstone, he becomes the foundation and the point of support for the rest of the building. They've rejected it. Can you imagine what happens to a building without a foundation stone without a capstone for an archway, the whole building is going to collapse and crumble. It may stand for a period of time until finally the whole thing just falls apart. And Jesus says in verse 43, I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And given to who? A people producing its fruits. What's the fruits of the kingdom? The word of God. Are we sharing God's word in this day and age? Are, are we delivering the message to those who need to hear it? And it's not just, it's not just me. This is, this is your opportunity. This is us, all of us together. Are we preaching the good news? Do the people of the world see God in us? Do they see Christ in the way we are living right now? The world's looking at, at various agencies. They're, they're looking at, they're looking at uh, the World Health Organization. They're looking at China. They're looking at the president. They're looking at our governor. And they're looking at people doing crazy things. And the question is, are we as Christians, are we doing crazy things? Or do we have our mind, our focus, our eyes on heaven? And there's even Christians doing crazy things. Are, <laughs> the Pharisees were very religious people but they were very wrong. What we want to be is religious people who are right. In spirit and in truth, worship give, is to be given. That's the type of people Jesus is after. That's the type of people the Father is after. I want to move on from here. Uh, we'll, come back to, uh, we'll come back to chapter 22, where we left off. But uh, I want to jump over to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1, because look at what happens here. And this is, this is that feast thing. Look at what happens. Chapter 26 and verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people, they gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But, they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Here's, here is that parable we just looked at is coming to fruition. It's, it's a, a short-term prophecy given by Jesus. They know it's about them. And they plan to kill him. The very thing that he warned them about. If they kill the son, what's going to happen to them? And the answer is, everything's going to be ripped from them and given to somebody who bears fruit. Now, what... I want our attention to be on for this moment is this. They don't want to do it during the feast. They don't want people gathered together. What they want is people separated. They want people home. They want people quiet because then they can do their nefarious deeds. And, and are we paying attention? They want to do it after the feast. They don't want to do it during the feast. They want it after the feast. Ah, but opportunity knocks. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14. In Matthew 26, 14, moving over, we read this. Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. We know this story. We're familiar with the story. We know about Judas's betrayal and, and how Jesus will go to the kangaroo court trial. What we're not used to thinking or knowing about is that the Pharisees, the priests, the, the leadership, they were trying to avoid doing this during the Passover. But you see, God's in charge, not them. And and it's fascinating because they think they're in charge. They think what they're doing is what they want to do, when in reality, this is according to the plan of God from before the foundations of the world. 
If you listen to my radio broadcast this morning, we're looking at Psalm uh, Psalm 2, and, and, and very much so, Psalm 2 speaks about this moment, this time period, when Jesus is being, uh, yes, crucified. And Satan and, and the devil and the Pharisees, and they all think that they're winning, but Jesus doesn't stay dead. He is resurrected from the dead, and he ascends and sits at the right hand of the Father. These guys, the Pharisee, the chief priests, they sought to arrest Jesus after, after the festival, after the Passover, because they don't want the crowd upset. They don't want the people to be all riled up. They want to do this very quietly. They want to do this very hush-hush. God, however, middle of Passover, very publicly, very open. The whole world gets to see Jesus crucified because that's the plan. And that's in the mind of God. Turn over to Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew chapter, ooh, I got two big pages there. Matthew 27. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 15, this again, this is just it's mind-boggling because when you look at these parts and you, you put them together, you realize just how foolish we think we are in, in thinking that, that we've got this under control, that we are smart, we know what we're doing. Elsewhere in Scripture, God will say, my ways are higher than your ways. Look at what we read here, Matthew twenty-seven fifteen. Now at the feast, here's that feast again. The governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, if, if you recall, if you recall, Jesus, when he is crucified, he's not crucified by himself. There will be two robbers, one on his left and one on his right. It is not just Jesus that is here at this moment, but for comparison's sake, what we are given is this. Pilate has chosen the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst. Do you want Barabbas, a notorious prisoner? Or do you want Jesus, who is called the Christ? And, and J J Pilate's not going to go through Jesus' litany of who he is. He's, he's not going to go, King, Lord, Master, Messiah, Savior. He, well, he does say Christ. That's, that's Savior. He's not going to talk about how he healed numerous, hundreds, we don't know how many people, how many of his fellow people, how many Jews were healed. We don't know how many of them were given sight, were able to speak. We don't know how many of them were able to walk, leprosy cured, demons cast out, people raised from the dead. We don't know those things, but they did. They saw them. They know who Jesus is, and they know who Barabbas is. Notor notorious prisoner. And so Pilate gives him the choice in verse 17. Whom do you want? Barabbas? Jesus, who was called the Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Envy? Remember our parable that we started with. Remember how the, the renters of the vineyard figured if we killed the son, if we kill him, then the vineyard will be ours. But when Jesus gets to the end of that parable, they themselves recognize what's going to happen. They're going to lose the vineyard. They're going to lose it. And yet they go through the motions thinking that what they're doing is right, knowing that it's not right. And isn't that weird? They know murder's wrong. They know the court trial's wrong. They know that, that Jesus has harmed nobody. And then you've got this Barabbas guy, this notorious prisoner, and we've got this Jesus who's called the Christ. And who, who will you release? And who will you kill? And 
Now, while Pilate is awaiting their judgment, their judgment, verse 19, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Notice that the choice was the crowds and they listened to the chief priests and the elders. The religious leaders, they know best, right? They know best. Barabbas, Barabbas, we want Barabbas. We want a notorious prisoner. We want evil because this guy who claims to be the Christ, he is the Christ, but going with their position, he claims to be the Christ. He's far more dangerous. How so? How so is he far more dangerous than somebody who is willing to take the life of another human being? Because they don't just crucify anybody. Crucifixion was saved. Crucifixion was reserved for slaves who run away, murderers, insurrectionists. And then there's Jesus. And so Pilate asks them in verse 22, what then shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? And they said to him, let him be crucified. But he said, why? What, what evil has he done? Oh, we are, we are so smart. What evil has he done? Oh, we'll just shout louder all the more. Let him be crucified. Maybe, maybe, maybe being in a crowd is not such a good thing. Maybe being in large groups is not such a wise choice. Maybe going to huge festive occasions. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We as Christians, we need to be more than that. And when our religious leaders tell us, this is what we must do, this is the way we must do it, what we really need to do, and that includes me, what we really need to do, what does the scriptures say? say about such matters what do the scriptures say about such things are we following god see because the the pharisees the the priests the scribes they knew and yet they set all of that aside they knew what the right thing to do was and they did the wrong thing and god is going to through that do bring about salvation for all of mankind but that's in spite of them. God does not want them to do these things. God doesn't sanction their evil actions. God is going to use their evil actions to bring about good. That's what God is after. That's what God is doing. And we, are we busy doing good? Or are we doing evil thinking that it's good? Again, they were willing to have Barabbas released and have the Christ crucified. The people, the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, the chief priests. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? I want to return. Uh... I stopped reading earlier at Matthew chapter 21 and verse 46. I want to return to the next parable in chapter 22 and verse 1. Because remember the parable we read about the tenants. Jesus says, 
the vineyard is going to be taken away from them and given to people producing its fruits. That's verse 43 in chapter 21. Look at, look at Matthew 22, verse 1, because Jesus is not done. He's not done dealing with the religious elites, the leaders, those who think that they've got it all under their belt and they're in control and they're going to do things their way. Look at what happens in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Sound familiar? Sounds an awful lot like that other parable, doesn't it? Verse 7, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Now, <laughs> We're not done with the parable, but this is, I love this thought. Those invited were not worthy. And so who is worthy? And the answer is everybody else. The, the strangers, the not noteworthy. Because remember, this is a king. He's having a wedding feast. Who do, you, who do kings invite to wedding feasts? And the answer is other kings, other dignitaries, other prominent citizens of, of the world, the people that he wants to show off his son and have them come and all of that business. Common people are not invited to king's wedding feasts. People that are just trying to make a living in this world. They're not invited to king's wedding feasts. But that's what we see in verse 9. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as are godly. That's how some people want to phrase it. Go to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as are perfect. That's not what that's not what God says. Go and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Every one who hears is invited. Will you come to the wedding feast? He's not done. Verse 10. And those servants they went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found. Ooh, this is tough. Good and bad. Bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. All these people at this wedding feast. Strangers. Common people. Everyday people. People the king doesn't know. People, people he, he didn't invite to his first feast. Not, not other dignitaries. Not other kings. Not other rulers. But these are just everybody else. Wedding halls filled with these guests. Now, to understand uh, this next paragraph, you have to know there's there's a culture thing here that's different from ours. From ours, with our wedding culture, what we do is uh, the wedding guests they come and they bring gifts for the new couple, which which you know it, it makes sense. You know they're getting started together in life and they need support and help and encouragement. So you bring things that they can find useful and wedding gifts. Uh, you know the the registry, all of that is very useful, very helpful showing concern and love for these, this young couple that's getting started in, in their life. But back here, back in this day when Jesus is speaking, wedding feasts were very different. When you have a wedding feast, what you did is, as the host, you gave your attendants, you gave those who came clothing. 
You gave them gifts for coming because you're showing off, you're showcasing to the world that your son is getting married and you want to show everybody how wealthy you are, how proud you are of your son and how supportive you are of this wedding. And so as the guests come, they receive from you gifts. And in that day and age, one of the most important, valuable gifts you could give them is clothing. Look, look, at, look at what happens here in verse 11. Because the king's going to go out and he's going to see his wedding hall. Look what happens in verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. See, in our culture, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot except for, well, you didn't, maybe you didn't dress up for the wedding. You see, in that day, the king gave all of his guests wedding garments to wear. And he looks out into this crowd of people he doesn't know, and he, he sees one without a wedding garment. You, you don't belong. You're not a part of this. And, and verse 12, and he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? You should have a wedding garment. You, where's your wedding garment? What's, and, and notice the response. The friend, he was, he was speechless. He has nothing to say. There is no defense for not wearing a wedding garment at the king's wedding feast. You must wear the king's wedding garment. If you're not going to do that, you've, you cast aspersions on the king. You're, you're not honoring the king. You're not honoring his son. You are not. Oh, well, you don't get to stay. Look at what he says in verse 13. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So notice in this parable, the initial guests ignored the invitation from the king. The initial guests said, well, you've got better things to do. We're not coming to your wedding feast. And the king made certain that they did not come because he, verse after they killed his servants, verse 7, the king just burned the city, killed everybody that, that did this to his servants. And justly so. They killed his servants first, right? This is, this is justice. But then graciously, God, the king, invited everybody else to come to this wedding feast. And everybody came in, but there was one guest that, that is chosen here that did not wear the wedding garment, choosing to spite the king, choosing to malign the king, choosing instead, I don't need what you have, and I can be independent without the king. And the king says, well, in that case, out you go. You don't get to stay. But God has set up a wedding feast. And who is invited? And I, I love verse 10. All whom they found, both good, both bad and good. I keep getting it reversed. Both bad and good. Both bad and good. We, we tend to think, oh, Christians, they got it all right. They, they, they live perfect lives. They don't sin. They never make mistakes. They are, they are just, well, that's not true. You know, the, the phrase is given that I'm not perfect. I'm just saved. I'm not perfect. I am forgiven. I'm not perfect, but I am invited. We as Christians, <laughs> whether we've sinned greatly or sinned little, we, we, we all have. And, and whether we are sick with the virus or not, we are all invited to God's feast with the Son. That's Jesus. And, and again, you know, Jesus' parables here, he's talking against the religious elites. And again, remember, we read the verses. They have their plots. They have their schemes. And God's just going to use them right along to achieve his purpose and his scheme. We, the Son, has had his wedding feast. It is with his bride. There's one bride. That is the church. Jesus gave his life for the church to buy her with his blood. 
Are we in or are we out? Are we listening to God and Jesus? Are we willing to, and, and, and I love this fact, you're here this morning with me because that shows that you want to be in. That shows that you want to be a part of this because by joining, by willing to say, I'm going to set aside my time. I'm going to set aside my life. I'm going to set aside my things. Remember, those that were invited, they're, they're, they're like, I'm busy. One has to go to his farm, another to his business. They got things that they're doing. Those guys don't get to come to the wedding feast. So that's part of the equation. But the other part of the equation is, are you wearing the garment that the king has given you to wear? Have you put on Christ in baptism? I, I can't say it any plainer than that. That's, that's what this reference is about, is becoming a subject of the king. Are you wearing his garment? Are you saying, yes, you are my king. And it's not a literal garment that we need to wear. But it is indeed wearing Jesus Christ, putting him on in baptism. We as Christians, we gather to worship and honor our God, our king. And, and we should. And his son, Jesus. And, and we have no right to exclude anyone from the kingdom. We don't do that. Who is excluded from the kingdom? Those who decide not to come. Those who do not want to put on the garment of the king. Those are the ones that are excluded. It is not us that keep people out, but it is they themselves that keep them out. God doesn't say, well, only certain people are allowed. God tried that with the Israelites. Only certain people are allowed in, and then suddenly those certain people weren't allowing anyone else in. With Christ, with Christianity, who is allowed in? And the answer is everyone. But you have to be a subject of the king. You have to put on his wedding garments. So the invitation's for you. This preaching is for you. Are you wearing the wedding garment of the king? Have you been immersed into Christ? Do you believe in Jesus as Lord? Have you acknowledged that he is in charge? Are you producing the fruits? Going back to our first parable, are you producing the fruits that God desires or are you keeping it all for yourself? That's a heart issue and you need to check that yourself. I can't do it for you. I can't see if you're wearing the wedding garments of the king. That's your call. But I do know those who are not, they don't get to stay. That's verse 13 of chapter 22. Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. You have to be in the king, in the kingdom of the king. It's my preaching for you this morning. Let's continue our worship, Lord's Supper. I've talked about it numerous times. Jesus going to the cross for us. And, and we've looked at some of the verses that surround him going to the cross. We've looked at how the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't want to arrest Jesus during the Passover. And yet Jesus continuously told his disciples, this is when it's going to happen. And I will be crucified. The, the, um, Judas, the betrayer, he went to the, the Pharisees, he told them that Jesus is going to be in this place. He's going to be in the garden. And they hurriedly get together, their troops, to, to arrest Jesus. And they put Jesus through this kangaroo court trial. And, and finally, they finally get him over to Pilate. And Pilate, remember, Pilate says, this man is innocent. There, I can find no wrong in him. And, and they shout. Remember, we read this in, in Matthew 27, verse 23. They shout all the louder, let him be crucified. He is my Lord and yours, hopefully. His crucifixion before the night before he was betrayed, the day before he was crucified, Jesus said, he makes a new covenant. 
This is, this is why the baptism is so important. This is why believing on Jesus, repenting of a sinful lifestyle, repenting of an ungodly lifestyle is so important. And so is the baptism because this is where you get into that new covenant. He says, this is my body. This bread is my body to his disciples. This fruit of the vine is my blood spilled for the new covenant. Not the old one, but the new one. And I want to read, I want to read his death moment. For Matthew 27, I didn't make a note card for this, my apologies. Matthew 27 and verse 45, Jesus is on the cross. He has been crucified and he is not yet dead. In verse 45 of Matthew 27, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. What he's actually doing is quoting from the book of Psalms and reminding them that Jesus is taking the sin of the world for us. This is my body given for you. He took the bread. He broke it gave thanks. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. His willingness to go to the cross for us, his willingness to die for us, his willingness to be our, our brother, our friend. Our king. Our Messiah. Our savior. Our sacrifice. We remember his gift by partaking of this bread in his name. Amen. Fruit of the vine poured out his blood. He was scourged, which, which means being whipped. But not just with leather, which hurts. I've, I've been through that with my dad. Justly deserved, by the way. But the scourging usually had things attached to the leather straps, stones, flints, metal, bone, whatever would bring about additional damage to the skin, to tear the skin. And then he was beaten. And, and they put a crown of thorns on his head. And, and they're not little thorns like what you find on, on rose branches, but big thorns. And they crucified him. And his blood poured out. This is my... This is the new covenant in my blood. This is my blood. Jesus gave up his life, his blood, for the new covenant. Father, we thank you for your son's death. The sacrifice. Blood poured out so that our sins would be forgiven. We remember his gift by partaking this fruit of the vine. It's in his name we pray to you. Amen. We as saints are enjoyed by, we're commanded on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16. Contribution. This is, this is for us as saints. Some, uh, there have been some very gracious people who are not members of this congregation who have sent support 
and we're very thankful. We're very appreciative of those who have done so. This is our worship to God the Father, our worship to Jesus. This is our gift. And uh, as a reminder, we don't receive mail at our building. You have to mail it to the P.O. Box 222. Uh, if you go to the beach, because we'll be going to the beach, it's windy out today, but we'll be going to the beach because we'll be in our cars, right? And having lunch at the beach, you can always bring your contribution then and get it to Mike, but uh, you can drop it in the mailbox, P.O. Box 222. Let's go to Michigan, 48750. If you're a member of the church, we take up collection first day of the week, just as we partake of the Lord's Supper first day of the week. Uh, if you're not a member of the church, we're not asking you to give. For those who do, we're grateful. We appreciate your generosity. Let's pray over the offering. Let's pray over our sacrifice, our giving. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the things you've given to us, for our homes that keep us warm and safe and cool. We thank you for the food that we have to keep our bellies filled. We thank you for the jobs that we have to bless us and enable us to bless others. Father, we pray for those that are without jobs. We pray that you'll watch over them and, and be with them. And may we support and help them in any way we can during this time. And, and we pray that when uh, things start to recover, that ample jobs will be found for them, that they can continue to work with their hands and provide for their families. Father, we ask that you bless those who are without right now. And may we, as your saints, bless those who are without Maybe, may we be willing to share our second tunic with those who have none. Father, this contribution, we ask that you would use it to further your kingdom, to spread the word, the good news, that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And all are invited to the wedding feast. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray to you. Amen. All right, saints. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Uh, we'll be back here at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, this is normally our potluck Sunday. We're not going to have potluck, but Sunday nights, uh, potluck Sunday night is normally Stump the Preacher Night. And I'm more than willing to do that, but it's going to take input from you. And so if you've got questions, make sure you text them to me. Oh, oh. Make sure you text them to me. You can text them to my phone, 305-2721. Or you can send them to me on Facebook. Send me a message on Facebook. Uh, just write to the Uskota Church of Christ. I'll get your questions. I, I, I need those questions so I can answer them. If you don't send me questions, I can't answer them. You're certainly welcome to uh, send me questions when we go live tonight at 6. But it's a little bit easier if you get them to me beforehand. Not just so I can pre-study, but so that I can understand what you're asking and maybe clarify some things. So that'll be tonight, 6 o'clock. You're welcome to join us. We'll be going live 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, we'll be doing Stump the Preacher. And uh, again, you can send me questions. You can send me uh, texts or give me a phone call, 989-305-2721. I look forward to seeing you at the beach for lunch. I look forward to seeing you tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, Wednesday night, we're doing a uh, Bible study at 7 o'clock, again live in the book of Exodus. Saints, it's good to be with you today. God bless. We got music. <laughs>